So now to pick up right where we left off, we have completed the idea of embryonic tissue development being a big step in the development, overall development of the body plan that an animal will have. Either they will be diploblastic or triploblastic, depending on their orientation of ectoderm, endoderm, and mesoderm, respectively. Now we can conclude our body plan discussion by explaining what body cavities and their role are in the establishment of a body plan. So body cavities. Now this cannot be understood, this concept of body cavities, without looking at figure 32.9. So as we go over this, open your textbook, have figure 32.9 open, and look at the different terms that are about to come up. So, first term to understand, um, something that we briefly mentioned before, is the idea of a coelom. Not a colum, but a coelom. And a coelom is simply going to be defined as a body cavity. That's all we need to define coelom as. So we have the technical term for a body cavity, which is a coelom. Now, specifically, a coelom has some requirements in order to be a true coelom, to be a nice body cavity within the body plan of an animal. And that is that it has to be a fluid-filled space. So it's a cavity, yes, it ha it's an empty space, but that empty space is uh, fluid-filled. And in addition, it has to be between the body wall, and it also has to be between the digestive tube. So right in between the digestive tube and the body wall. So that's going to be where our empty, fluid-filled body cavity is. And again, this is a key evolutionary step because it's only in triploblasts. So now we've already cut out an entire group of organisms. The diploblastic organisms, they do not have coelums, okay? So now we can further subdivide triploblastic organisms, another key animal evolutionary step into their presence of body cavities, okay? Whether or not they have a coelom, which we'll get to right now. So it's only in triploblast. We ignore the diploblastic organisms. Um, and so we also are definitely going to ignore something that doesn't even have tissues, let's say. Because these both have tissues, we can ignore something like the uh, periphera, the sponges. Those are not going to be part of this body cavity discussion. Okay, so what do we need to know about coelums and the specific types of body cavities? Well, there are three types of interest to us. And they are as follows. There are going to be a class of coelums known as acoelomates. There are going to be a class of coelums known as pseudocoelomates. And there are also going to be a class of coelums known as just straight up coelomates. So what differentiates these? Well, this one you should be able to tell already. Acoelomates. These are going to be organisms, triploblastic organisms that have no coelom. Well then how could they possibly be considered uh, a triploblast or how can they have a body cavity if they don't have the coelom? Well what they do have is, and I just want to reiterate something, that they are triploblastic still, don't get me wrong, but they just have a solid interior. They have a solid body cavity. So they have a solid body, thus they don't have a real coelom. They don't have a fluid filled coelom because of this solid nature of their coelom and I'll re write that down as the fact that there's no fluid here. And in order to have a coelom, you have to have a fluid-filled space. You don't have the fluid, and you have a solid-filled space, you're an acoelomate. Look at figure 32.9. That'll really help you understand this idea of a no coelom, how can it still be a coelom uh, concept. Next is a pseudocoelomate. The root pseudo just means fake or false. And this is actually going to, it is going to be a, a fluid-filled coelom. So it, it does pass the criteria that the acoelomates fail. So it is a fluid-filled coelom, but where do we have the pseudo, the falseness? The falseness comes from the fact that the body cavity, the coelom itself, though fluid-filled, it's not completely lined with mesoderm. So we'll write that down as not completely lined with something known as mesoderm. And mesoderm, if we uh, look at this part right here, is the middle layer. If you are completely surrounded by mesoderm and you are a fluid-filled coelom, fluid-filled cavity, that is when you will be a coelomate. That is when you will be a true coelom. Now, if you can't visualize the idea of mesoderm surrounding this cavity, look at figure 32.9. That's why it's there. If you are a true coelom, true coelomate, your body cavity 
this coelom will be completely lined with mesoderm. So we'll write that down as body cavity completely. This is the final characteristic, final criteria, final step of evolution. Body cavity completely lined with mesoderm or mesoderm, whatever you want to call it. Okay? So completely lined. This is not completely lined. This has nothing to do with any of that. Just doesn't have a fluid-filled coelom to begin with. So those are our three types of body cavities present. Um, acelomates, pseudocelomates, and coelomates. We are of the coelomate class, um, and that should be pretty obvious because of our complexity at least. Um, and then finally, the very last thing I want to talk about, we keep on saying coelom, we keep on you know, saying having a body cavity. Well, what is the purpose? Why would we even need a body cavity? Why is this even being mentioned? Why are we talking about this? Well, let's look at the advantages of a coelom. Very briefly, what are the reasons for a coelom? Why is this evolutionarily evolved? Well, that's because a coelom provides a hydrostatic skeleton for an organism. Hydrostatic skeleton. When you think of hydro, you think of water, you think of fluid. And a coelom is a fluid-filled space. But what does this have to do with the skeleton of the organism? Well, this is going to be, the, the coelom itself is going to be a fluid fluid-filled region, right? But that fluid-filled region will be under pressure. And when fluid is under pressure within the whatever animal body you're studying, this will eventually result in a nice form of movement. So because fluid is under pressure, that pressure will yield movement because of the hydrostatic skeleton that these type of organisms, the coelomates, have. Okay? Next, um, in terms of advantages, this is also going to be a mechanism, M-E-C-H for mechanism, that's going to be useful for moving circulatory materials. So when we refer to this idea of circulatory materials, we mean things that are within the blood. That's what circulatory is referring to. But how can we move the blood around? How can we move the things within the blood around? Well, we utilize a fluid-filled space because fluid is a good uh, medium for moving things like circulatory material. So for this reason, we don't need to be flat because the prior need to be flat in lower order animals and lower order organisms was to minimize surface area to volume ratio in order for things to move around quickly and efficiently but that's not necessary anymore because we have a whole circulatory system that can quickly and efficiently move things around for us and in order for that to happen you must have a coelom you must have a fluid filled space um, and this is of course going to allow for us to increase our overall surface area to volume ratio of our entire body. Finally, the last thing in terms of the advantages is that a coelom enables internal organs, so things like your heart, your liver, your lungs, all things that are within you, organs, complex structures of animal kingdom, enables internal organs to grow and move so your heart is a moving organ, your lungs are moving organs, they don't just stay there, they actually have capabilities of moving within you, independent of the outer body wall. So, like, when we think of the fact that we have an outer body towards us, we have a skin, we have our hands that are moved, we, when we run, why are things kept in place and why are things not rushing around all throughout us within our internal structures? Well, that's because you have this coelom, this fluid-filled space that allows for an independent growth and movement. These structures like our heart, lungs, liver, whatever it may be, can move independently regardless of what our, our outer body walls are doing, what we're doing um, in essence in the real world. And that's what allows us to keep our structure, keep our shape. That's a big important part of our multicellularity, morphological uh, overall structure that animals possess. So that concludes our idea of body cavities, body cavities, embryonic tissue development, differentiation of cells and tissues, and also symmetry. Four major body plans four major evolutionary steps with sub-steps within them that are necessary for us to understand uh, and appreciate the complexity of animal diversity, animal characteristics specifically, in our overall study of animals.